So what happens when we die? It's a question that humanity has wrestled with throughout history. What happens after we die? I remember being able to see my dad and his friend Olin Palmer, who had passed away less than a month before he did. The light started to appear. And that's when I realized that this was death. Some people claim they know because they've actually experienced it. They share incredible stories like reconnecting with deceased loved ones or learning the meaning of life. That I am going through the gates of the city of God. I'm in heaven. I'm home. What happens when we die? This is an age-old question that mankind is still striving to answer. As humans, there are fewer things we are more conscious of than our own mortality. The concept of an afterlife permeates all races, cultures, continents, and religions. So much so, there is scarcely a religion or culture, ancient or modern, that does not believe in some form of life after death. For many, a belief in an afterlife is based on religious texts, like the Bible, and the words of Jesus who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not unlike ancient cultures and pagan religions, our modern society and professed Christians alike also derive hope for an afterlife from the stories of those who claim to have come back from the dead. Such stories are today often referred to as near-death experiences. Experienced all of the suffering that I gave away from the interior view and personal experience of every single person that I hurt in a chronological sequence in my life. It happened, my spirit rose up and out of the river and I was immediately greeted by a group of people or spirits, beings. The next thing I know is I was just in a bright, bright place. A near-death experience takes place in a near-death context, but it has to involve the losing of wakeful consciousness and then a number of specific kinds of experiences that you have when you're not wakefully conscious. And typically, there's an out-of-body experience. Hovering over my body, looking down upon myself. The next second I was up on the ceiling looking down at the entire room. So I wasn't, I was no longer in the physical hospital room. I was completely in another realm. I actually felt connected to my family on the other side. My spirit came up and I went through the tunnel. Angel Studios, the popular distributor for such films as Sound of Freedom and Christian content like the TV show The Chosen, have released a new documentary called After Death that aims to merge the latest scientific research with near-death experiences to restore people's confidence in the reality of a life after death. What comes after death? It was a wake-up call. 75% of the people in that first study had had a documented cardiac arrest. People who are dying feel that they actually are waking up to a reality that makes this state of existence seem as though you're asleep. I'm Stephen Gray. I'm one of the directors of After Death. On July 8th, 2012, my brother-in-law was tragically killed. And just shy of a year and a half later, my father-in-law suddenly died. These tragic losses led me to ask really difficult questions like, where are they now? And is there a heaven? So I embarked on a journey of looking for answers, both in the Bible, as well as through personal accounts of people who had died and had these experiences. Stephen Gray has spent many years examining near-death experiences in the search for answers, but he is not the only one. In 2012, philosopher John Martin Fisher spent $5 million to study immortality and near-death experiences. Bob Olson, a private investigator, spent 15 years researching the topic and wrote a book, Answers About the Afterlife. The Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies is even offering up to $1 million in grants for the study of communication with post-mortem or discarnate consciousness. And there are many others who have spent the majority of their lives in untold amounts of money and wealth, searching, studying, looking, and striving for definite answers about what happens when we die. Today 
in our Oz Talk, the science of near death. Dr. Sam Parnia, author of Erasing Death, is here. He's leading the largest ever medical mm -hmm. study into the topic of death. And what he teaches us, the stories mm -hmm. of people that have come back from the death, can help us avoid mm -hmm. any regrets when that moment comes. Until very recently, we couldn't bring people back after they had died. Okay, and so basically it was thought to be purely philosophical or religious, but today there is a science by which we can bring them back. They describe a sensation of experiencing a bright, warm, welcoming light that draws the person towards it. They describe a sensation sometimes of experiencing their deceased relatives, almost as if they've come to welcome them. Can science give us any answers about the afterlife? Do near-death experiences provide definite answers? And what has God himself revealed about this subject? While almost all of us have at one point pondered what happens when we die, and thousands of others have spent years, decades, and their entire lives and untold millions of dollars searching for answers, they still have not been able to find a definite truth concerning life after death. The answer for which they have been searching has all the time been right under their noses. What is the truth? The truth is not at all what billions on earth today believe it to be. Let us begin by examining whether science can offer any conclusive answers to this question. It's a fascinating new study about the mysteries of death. It shows that even though the brain shuts down within 30 seconds of the heart stopping, some people who survive have memories of what happened around them, sometimes minutes later. What does your study show about what happens to the brain after the heart stops? Contrary to the way that doctors have been taught, that after the heart stops, the brain does not die. It hibernates and it shows the ability to recover even an hour longer afterwards. The new research shows that the brain remains active moments before one's last breath. Scientists made the findings while analyzing data of patients after life support was removed. Scientists say, however, it is not possible to accurately tell at this point what the brain activity translates into. When I first started looking into near-death experiences back in the late 1970s, that there would be some physiological explanation for that. The various simple explanations we could think of, like lack of oxygen, drugs given to the people, and so forth, don't pan out. The data do not support them. And furthermore, the phenomena of NDEs, of near-death experiences, seem to defy a simple materialistic explanation. As technology advances, it seems only to more clearly reveal its ineptitude for explaining things like near-death experiences. In the 21st century, our culture thinks as science advances, it will unveil all mysteries. But the truth is, science has a limit. Dictionary.com explains science as systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. When it comes to supernatural events, science, if it is honest, is forced to bow its head and concede it cannot explain or even begin to study supernatural realities, for these, by definition, are beyond the physical or material world and cannot be explained, measured, accurately reproduced, or even therefore understood through natural laws or processes. Seem to defy a simple materialistic explanation. Measuring the loss of blood pressure, the lack of oxygen, or fading electrical signals to the brain are immeasurably insufficient tools for determining where we go when we die. Nevertheless, one of the principles of the scientific method is observation. And this brings us to the near-death experiences themselves. Are these observations of life after death insight into life's greatest mysteries? Or are they the results of imagination? or something else. Then suddenly appearing by the side of my bed were three ancient looking men, ancient in that they were old, but they were beyond old. Typically those who have near-death experiences almost always share the same feelings, emotions, and sensations. While no two near-death experiences are the same, those of us that research them see a very consistent pattern of elements. They may see their deceased relatives at, the, at loving reunions, even deceased pets. By this time, they're typically feeling overwhelming positive emotions. Be it love, peace, or joy, to an extent they never felt on Earth. However, the information they learn or take away from these experiences is oftentimes very different. Take a look at these two stories and see if you can spot the difference. Charlotte says she was led into heaven by angels. There's no fear. It's, it's like pure joy. 
She says she then began to recognize deceased family members. I seen my mom. I seen my dad. I seen my sister. I seen family members standing behind. I seen saints of old. I seen a toddler. And that toddler, I couldn't understand. And I can remember thinking, who is this? And I heard my father say to me, my heavenly father say to me, it's your child. Um, I lost that child. I was five and a half months pregnant. I can remember them holding the baby up and saying, Charlotte, it's a boy. Then he was gone. Then God chose to show her one more thing. God took me to the edge of hell. And I looked down and the smell and then rotten flesh. That's what it smelled like and, and screams. After seeing the beauty of heaven, the contrast to seeing hell is almost unbearable. And he says, I show you this to tell you. If some of them do not change their ways, this is where they shall reside. I heard my father say, you have time to go back and share. As quickly as she had gone to heaven, Charlotte's spirit came back. Night, I left my body. And I found myself flying through this star-filled realm. All I felt was everything a human ever wants to feel. Just acceptance and love and joy and being held. Then I landed. I landed in a place that was solid. It had indirect lighting and there were gurneys around and there was equipment that was hanging from the ceiling. It was like a facility or a clinic or something. And right in front of me were there were beings. There were these three short little hooded guys and they looked exactly like those beings in the movie Communion. The guys I saw, they were in front of me. They had big smiles on their face and they had these dark hoods and uh, squatty little bodies. And then there was this other guy and he was sort of in charge. He was kind of in the background. He came forward and he was this tall, wispy guy. And he had this incredible ecstatic smile. His eyes were open, his eyebrows were up and he had this wonderful smile and laugh. And he was obviously in charge, but he was the best boss anybody could ever have. He wasn't, uh, you know, a, very strict at all. When he came forward towards me, my throat just tightened and my chest expanded. And I thought I was going to break down in uncontrollable crying from love. There was so much love pouring from this being that it was overwhelming. It was paralyzing. It was just he and I, and uh, he came forward and he he's like, okay, you're going back. And he, as he stepped forward, I felt myself slipping back. The place just started to break up. It started to dematerialize. It's like I was being beamed out of there and I was going to another channel, I was going to another frequency. And it was a descending feeling and I dropped away into darkness. It wasn't a good place. It wasn't um, someplace you wanted to be. It was lonely and it was dismal. And when we leave our bodies, when we die and leave our bodies our vibration is going to match that low vibration of that those lower places and that's well where we'll be stuck it's not forever it's just till we sort out where we went wrong in this life and because we are these infinite amazing beings if you listen to those people who you know they they give a um a video about going to hell it almost every time it's like they sort it out one woman was in a coma for weeks, and at one point she she sorted it out and she started um, singing a spiritual song that she sang in church, and she popped right out of hell. <laughs> and, and but and she said that most of the time she had no idea she was dead. This thing about leaving this world in an astonished state, you know, you're going to bump around in these low vibrational places until you can sort out that astonishment. And for some, it's it could be a long time. We die realizing uh, that we live forever and we can't be harmed. 
this thing we call death, we've got it completely backwards. It is a beautiful thing. It is a 10 million percent upgrade instantly. We have not lost anybody. They've slipped out of the physical and they've gone home and they're just a little further up the trail than we are right now, but we'll see them again and everything is fine. Everything is beyond fine for them. Did you spot the contradiction? The woman heard God tell her that if people don't change their ways, they will reside forever in hell, while God showed the man, in his experience, that people are not in hell forever and can even advance out of hell. This is why he could conclude, we haven't lost anybody. The Christian woman was told by God to come back to life and share in order that others might hear about Jesus and be saved. In her experience, there was accountability for the things done in this life and eternal consequences. But in the man's experience, there is no accountability and no eternal consequences because you can, as he said, figure it out and then pop out of hell. The Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, which claims to be the largest near-death experience website in the world, has documented 5,200 experiences from all over the world in many languages for the last 25 years. These experiences have been carefully cataloged, rated, and sorted on the website and are available for anyone to view. One document on the website contains the responses to the question, have your religious beliefs or spiritual practices changed specifically as a result of your experience? This document contains answers from 473 individuals, and this is how some of them answered this question. Chuck said, I am no longer religious. Martin said, I now know that God is real and that heaven is real. While Clyde said, I no longer believe in heaven or hell of the Bible. Shanna said she met Jesus in heaven, and I believe Jesus is God the Father of heaven and earth, she said. While Karen said, I do not believe I need to go to church, and the Bible is all about installing fear. Anthony said, I went from doubting that there is a God to not only believing but converting to Judaism. While Jeanette said, I converted from Christianity to paganism. And Philip said, yes, I was a Christian, but because of the spiritual contacts I have had over the years, I decided to fully embrace witchcraft back in 2006. Debbie said, I do not believe in judgment or being saved. Salem said, all religions gods are untrue, but Sherry said, no religion is right or wrong. Jean, however, says she is much more religious. I now practice metaphysical Judaism. While Elaine said, I no longer believe in God or the Bible. Barbara said, I now believe in reincarnation. Gary says he's become a medicine man or shaman. Jeffrey says he spoke with the Blessed Mother after committing suicide, while Sarah says she now lives to hold Father and Mother God's hands. While Aridia said, I was standing in front of Vishnu. He was seated on the grass in the lotus pose, wearing only a brown loincloth. Shanna said she stood before the Holy Trinity, saying, I understood everything. But Jill said the Trinity is for people who can't think for themselves. Suffice it to say, near-death experiences are wide and diverse, and the information a person receives from these experiences is inconsistent and in most cases contain blatant contradictions. My point here is not to demean the experiences people had, but only to show that studying near-death experiences is a terrible way to ascertain definite answers pertaining to the truth about what happens when we die. The National Academies Press in Washington, D.C. says concerning replicability in matters of science that replication is one of the key ways scientists build confidence in the scientific merit of results. When the result from one study is found to be consistent by another study, it is more likely to represent a reliable claim to new knowledge. Applying this principle of ascertaining scientific veracity to near-death experiences the only rational conclusion would be that near-death experiences can provide no conclusive answers about life after death because they are so inconsistent and immeasurably diverse. And on top of these complexities, there is the matter of ascertaining whose near-death experiences are genuine and whose are not. Alex Malarkey, he was in a very serious car accident with his father back in 2004, and after suffering serious injuries, in fact, he's a, a quadriplegic, uh, he 
actually decided to tell everyone and write a book about his experience dying, going to heaven, meeting Satan, having a few conversations with him, and then coming back to life. The story apparently sounded so plausible and inspirational that it was made into the best-selling book, which was co-authored by his father, Kevin. Published in 2010, the publishers now say they will be pulling the book from the shelves, but Alex said he made the whole thing up in an attempt to attract attention. Now, as a teenager, he's decided to come forward and say, yeah, I made the entire thing up. He says, I did not die, I did not go to heaven. So he gets a little more detailed about the reasons why he lied. He says, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. There is only one place in the universe where we do find a consistent teaching about life after death and that is within the 66 books of the Bible, written by 40 authors over a period spanning approximately 2,000 years and three continents, that also contain the teachings of God and His Son concerning what happens when we die. For example, in the book of Job, the question is asked, But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? How many billions are still asking this question? How many millions of dollars have been spent searching for answers? Is it possible that even those who claim to believe in the Bible, like Stephen Gray and the filmmakers of After Death, along with millions of other Christians, have missed the fact that the answer to this lifelong question is directly answered in the Bible in the three verses following this question in the book of Job? Immediately after we read, But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? The answer is given. As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so man lieth down, and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. O oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret, until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time, and remember me. According to this verse, when a man dies, he lies down into a sleep, which is in the grave. In the Psalms, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. God said to Moses concerning his death, and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Also, Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. We read, David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And Peter said, David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers. Did David wing his way to heaven at death? Paul writes, for David is not ascended into the heavens. The fact that David remains in the grave until the resurrection proves that the righteous do not go to heaven at death. This does not mean that David was not saved or that he won't be in heaven eventually. What it means is that the Bible testifies to the fact that death is like a sleep. Jesus also taught that death was like a sleep in the New Testament. He said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Clearly the lesson Jesus was teaching the disciples is that death is like sleep. The reason why the Bible likens death to sleep is simple. There is no consciousness in death. This is not my opinion. This is exactly what the Bible says. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Here is a thus saith the Lord, the dead know not anything. For this reason Solomon continues, saying, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, 
For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So where do the dead go? In the grave, he says. And in the grave there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge. But in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. When Job asked, Man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? He also answered the question as to how long one would be in the grave. He says, So man lieth down, and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Man lies down, and rises not, until something takes place till the heavens be no more. Does the Bible tell us when the heavens shall be no more? It sure does. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the heavens shall pass away. When? When the day of the Lord will come. When Jesus returns, the heavens will pass away and melt with fervent heat. But this is not the only clue Job gives concerning how long he would sleep in the grave. He adds, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Job says he expected to sleep in the grave unconscious of anything transpiring around him and unconscious of time until a change would take place. What change is this? The Apostle Paul writes of this change, saying, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The change that takes place is when the dead are resurrected at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And this change is when this mortal must put on immortality. And all this happens at the second coming of Jesus. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. There is the mention of the last trump. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And when the dead in Christ shall rise, they shall be changed and put on immortality. You can see then how the whole Bible is in perfect agreement. Peter agrees with Paul and Job agrees with Jesus. The Old and New Testaments alike all clearly teach that death is an unconscious sleep. The Bible has no problem with itself, but many Christians here have a problem with the Bible because they were taught growing up, and most of them are still taught and do believe as adults, that the Bible teaches their souls are immortal and that it is only the body that dies. But what saith the scriptures? Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And again, we read, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible is clear that a soul dies. Some of the confusion, however, comes from not understanding what the Bible defines a soul to be. When God created Adam, we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When God breathed into Adam's body the breath of life, that inanimate body God had formed became a living soul. In other words, a soul is a living, breathing person. The soul, therefore, is simply a reference to the individual. For example, John writes, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. The word souls is simply a reference to the persons. If a soul is separate from the body, as many believe, then in order to be consistent, they should be able to explain how a man's soul has a head 
and furthermore, how the soul's head can be beheaded. Furthermore, if the soul is immortal, how can John have written of the souls of them that were slain for the word of God? How can an immortal soul be slain? If a soul is a living, breathing person, however, then the text makes perfect sense. The inherent immortality of man or of an immortal soul is a teaching foreign to the scriptures. The Bible testifies that it is God who only hath immortality. Remember the most popular verse in the entire Bible? It also contains the truth about what happens when we die. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The choice then is perish or everlasting life, not everlasting life in hell or everlasting life in heaven. If man were inherently immortal, then Jesus need not have come to earth to die in order to set before us an invitation to receive everlasting life if we already had it. The word perish means exactly what it sounds like. It means death. Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Many point to Jesus' promise to the thief on the cross as evidence the thief ascended to heaven on the same day that he died. While on the cross, Jesus said to the repentant thief, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. If this indeed means Jesus and the thief were both in heaven after they died that day, then we have here a contradiction from the testimonies of Job and Paul and all the other apostles and prophets. But this is not a contradiction, because Jesus did not say, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What he said was, I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. The difference comes down to the placement of a comma. The punctuation in the Bible, like this comma, was not added in the Bible until about 700 years after the New Testament was written. Regardless of the punctuation, we can know for certain this verse was not intended to mean Jesus and the thief ascended to heaven that day, because three days later, after Jesus was resurrected, he said to Mary, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So where was Jesus during the three days that he was dead? The answer is, he was dead, unconscious in the grave, for the dead know not anything. If Jesus was immortal and went to heaven when he died, we have an even larger problem because truthfully, Jesus never really died. And if he never died, he cannot atone for our sins, for the wages of sin is death. One might ask, if the Bible does not teach that we have immortal souls, why is the whole world and even the whole Christian world and all of the ministers and evangelists and pastors and priests all teaching that we go to heaven when we die? This is a great question. The one who first taught that man would never die was the serpent in the garden. God said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Then the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And today nearly the entire world is fully convinced that the serpent was right and that God is wrong that we do not die after all, but continue on from one state of life to another state of life. Death is a transformation of consciousness from this physical domain, which is by and large illusory, to another dimension of existence. You had your grandpa named Pop, right? He died when I was about your age. He's very nice. You saw my grandfather? Where did you see him? In heaven. Is this him? Is this the man you saw? No, in heaven everybody's young. Is this him? Yeah, that's him. That's Pop. There is no shortage today of people who claim to have come back from heaven or hell with a multitude of stories and descriptions concerning where they were while they were dead. Sherry was dead. 
for 90 minutes. That stunning new book by the prominent doctor who not only claims he's been to heaven, but says he can prove it. Came out on the other side. There's a blinding light that freed me from pain. I felt pure peace and joy. Before you go back to your body, we want you to witness heaven. Now there are several accounts in the Bible of people who were resurrected from the dead. It might be of interest to see what they had to say. For example, there was the widow of Zarephath's son, who was resurrected by Elijah the prophet. There was the Shunammite woman's son in 2 Kings chapter 4. And a dead man was cast into the tomb of the prophet Elisha, but came back to life when he touched the prophet's bones. In the New Testament, the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus, who had been dead four days, were all resurrected by Jesus. Tabitha was resurrected by Peter, and Eutychus was resurrected by Paul. And after Jesus was resurrected, we read the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And yet in all these accounts, there is not one single word concerning where they were while they were dead. Why is that? It is because the dead know not anything and because there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. There was nothing for them to share, for they were unconscious. This is what the Bible plainly teaches and demonstrates concerning the dead. The doctrine of the natural immortality of the soul has also laid a most diabolical snare in the teaching that the rejectors of God's mercy are writhing in eternal torment. God says concerning those who reject his mercy, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So what will happen to the wicked? God says of the fire, it shall burn them up. First, Satan the root, then his followers the branches. Obadiah says of the wicked, So shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. While Satan is depicted as a hideous monster that rules hell for eternal ages, the God of the Bible declares he will be permanently destroyed. God said to Satan, Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. If that were not clear enough, God adds, I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth, and never shalt thou be any more. God is love, and God is just, and neither God's love nor his justice can allow the perpetuity of evil. Sin and evil and selfishness will and must come to an end. It is beyond the power of the human mind to estimate the evil which has been wrought by the heresy of eternal torment. The religion of the Bible, full of love and goodness and abounding in compassion, is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. When we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful Creator is feared, dreaded, and even hated? The appalling views of God which have spread over the world from the teachings of the pulpit have made thousands, yea millions, of skeptics and infidels. The theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of the abominations of Babylon, of which she makes all nations drink. How repugnant to every emotion of love and mercy and even our sense of justice is the doctrine that the wicked dead are tormented with fire and brimstone in an eternally burning hell, that for the sins of a brief earthly life they are to suffer torture as long as God shall live. What would be gained to God should we admit that he delights in witnessing unceasing tortures that he is regaled with the groans and shrieks and imprecations of the suffering creatures whom he holds in the flames of hell. Can these horrid sounds be music in the ears of infinite love? The innumerable multitude of our race that have hated and even finally rejected the pleadings of divine mercy on account of this doctrine will only be known to the mind of God. 
A large class to whom the doctrine of eternal torment is revolting are driven to the opposite error. They see that the scriptures represent God as a being of love and compassion, and they cannot believe that he will consign his creatures to the fires of an eternally burning hell. But holding that the soul is naturally immortal, they see no alternative but to conclude that all mankind will finally be saved. Many regard the threatenings of the Bible as designed merely to frighten men into obedience and not to be literally fulfilled. Thus, the sinner can live in selfish pleasure, disregarding the requirements of God and yet expect to be finally received into his favor. Such a doctrine, presuming upon God's mercy, but ignoring his justice, pleases the carnal heart and emboldens the wicked in their iniquity. But if the dead are already enjoying the bliss of heaven or writhing in the flames of hell, what need of a future judgment? The teachings of God's word on these important points are neither obscure nor contradictory. They may be understood by common minds. But what candid mind can see either wisdom or justice in the current theory? Will the righteous, after the investigation of their cases at the judgment, receive the commendation, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, when they've been dwelling in his presence, perhaps for long ages? And I said, well, everything that I have seen is so beautiful. Everything is so glorious. It's all so perfect. What about my sins? And he said, there are no sins. The vast tendency of near-death experiences lead people to disbelieve the Bible and the words of Jesus. People come away from near-death experiences not believing in a judgment, believing all will eventually be saved to eternal bliss regardless of their sins or good works, and all near-death experiences perpetuate Satan's first lie that the soul that sinneth shall not die, but live through eternal ages. The gospel is thus destroyed, the purpose of the life and death of our Savior Jesus Christ is undermined and counted worthless, and the destruction of the finally impenitent is discarded as a fable. Said Paul of this time, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Nowhere in the sacred scriptures is found the statement that the righteous dead go to their reward or the wicked to their punishment at death. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven. They are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. And time, be it long or short, is but a moment to them. They are awakened by the trump of God to a glorious immortality. As they are called forth from their deep slumber, they begin to think just where they ceased. The last sensation was the pang of death, the last thought that they were falling beneath the power of the grave. When they arise from the tomb, their first glad thought will be echoed in the triumphant shout, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? On the other hand, those who have rejected the obedience of Jesus as the substitute for their sins will continue to sleep until the second resurrection, just as Jesus taught. All shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Many take comfort in the idea of an immediate ascent to heaven at death. While this is not what the Bible teaches, to those that are dead it will seem as though it were, for their very next conscious thought will pick up right where they left off. You might ask then, well, what's the difference? If the dead in Christ do not immediately go to heaven or hell, but their next conscious thought is in the presence of Jesus, what difference does it make what we believe? And I tell you, it makes all the difference in the world, not for the dead, but for the living. And here's why. If we accept the Bible testimony that the dead know not anything, and that death is described as an unconscious sleep, then how do we explain these near-death experiences? Clearly something is happening here, for oftentimes people who have a near-death experience come back to life, knowing things that it would have been impossible for them to know. Mommy? Yes, Colton? 
Did you know I have a sister? You didn't know that Cassie's your sister? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? Honey, who told you I had a baby die in my tummy? In heaven, this little girl came up to me. She told me she died in your tummy. So how do we reconcile these supernatural experiences with the testimony of God's Word? The Bible testimony about what happens when we die is clear and consistent, but it contradicts near-death experiences. So what are we to do? Well, one of the more common experiences people have after they are dead is meeting other family members who have also died, or speaking with notable figures of the past who are dead. Comedian Tracy Morgan tells Oprah he believes he went to heaven when he was in a comatose state where he encountered his long deceased father. He had this green, this green thing on. That's, I just remember him saying, I'm not ready for you, son. Who was the first person that you saw and recognized? My grandfather. Mm. I had been with him when he died. I immediately recognized who it was, and it was um, one of my best friends named Anthony who had died. My dad was there, who I loved very much. I've had angels um, and even souls of loved ones, you know, guiding me all the time through my life. The Bible actually talks about speaking with the dead. God calls them familiar spirits. And this is exactly what King Saul did. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. At this point in time, the prophet Samuel had already died. King Saul had previously sought the prophet for instruction, but seeing that Samuel was dead and God was not answering him, he turned to this witch at Endor to call up Samuel from the dead. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And then King Saul has a conversation with Samuel. But here we may ask the same question we have with regard to near-death experiences. If Samuel had perished and was unconscious, then who was King Saul speaking with? He was speaking with a fallen angel. Paul speaks of such, saying, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Samuel did not come from the dead. There is no earthly or satanic power that can bring up a child of God from their rest in the grave. Nothing but the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. But Satan will work marvels for the guilty rejecters of truth who have connected themselves with him. And Satan did personate Samuel. This was a demonstration of satanic power. And at the end of time, the Bible tells us such manifestations of demons that perfectly personate dead loved ones and historic figures of the past will become more common. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Says the prophet, When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? In other words, should the living seek unto the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Then what does it mean that these demons will say? Isn't God telling us that they will contradict the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and they will speak contrary to his word? If men had been willing to receive the truth so plainly stated in the scriptures that the dead know not anything, they would see in the claims and manifestations of spiritualism the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders. But rather than yield the liberty so agreeable to the carnal heart and renounce the sins which they love, the multitudes close their eyes to the light 
and walk straight on, regardless of warnings, while Satan weaves his snares about them, and they become his prey. In the near future, many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. And our loved ones give us messages all the time. They're looking out for us. We shouldn't have to wait till our time comes to go home to heaven to believe. Why don't we believe now? We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. By the end of my second term, our founding fathers will be once again resting in peace as they deserve with three branches of government, not four. That's the way I look at it. Well, I commune with some of them, you know, on various weekends, the founding fathers. <laughs> I know they're around the bubble. I'd like to join you. Films like After Death and TV shows and movies and books that promote the practice of speaking to the dead are without number. God's word speaks plainly in regard to necromancy or speaking to the dead. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Marvelous beyond expression is the blindness of the people of this generation. Thousands reject the word of God as unworthy of belief and with eager confidence receive the deceptions guys, guys, of guys, Satan. Guys, guys, guys. What do you mean, blood? What do you want? <laughs> Come on now. Oh, sorry. Son of a the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul was preached by the serpent to Eve in Eden. Ye shall not surely die. And this declaration, resting solely upon the authority of Satan, is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom and received by the majority of mankind as readily as it was received by our first parents. The divine sentence, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, is made to mean the soul that sinneth, it shall not die, but live eternally. We cannot but wonder at the strange infatuation which renders men so credulous concerning the words of Satan and so unbelieving in regard to the words of God. The practice of necromancy, or speaking with the dead, be it in real life or in a near-death experience, has a larger, more sinister purpose in preparing the earth to receive the mark of the beast. Little by little, Satan has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time, and the world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. They are fast being lulled into a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. This is why I say, knowing what the Word of God declares concerning the dead means nothing to the dead, but everything to those that are living. For it is the living that are beguiled, as were Adam and Eve, into receiving lies that will lead them away from God, away from the Bible, and into perdition, because they will readily receive the advice of demons posing as departed loved ones, not discerning the deception. They see and hear a perfect representation of the ones they love, and they speak wonderfully comforting things, and even reveal new mysteries to them. And not knowing what the Bible teaches about death, they readily receive the counsel from demons. Your nose is bleeding. Your nose is bleeding. Wrap it up and call it a night, honestly. Yeah. Dude, you good? Dude. <laughs> from... Here to here. It felt like something bit me. Many near-death experiences report being able to float above their body or visit other rooms or locations on Earth while they are dead. And the author of this book, Journeys Out of the Body, would you welcome Robert Monroe. And my first response is, well, this is an odd kind of Freudian type dream. And I thought, well, I better get a good look at this man who was in bed with my wife. 
and I moved over a little bit closer, and with a great shock, I discovered that the man in bed with my wife was me. <laughs> so what is happening here? How are they doing this? The answer is, they aren't. They are seeing and hearing things taking place in other locations through the power of demonic spirits. This practice is commonly used in the occult world and is called spirit travel, soul travel, remote viewing, or astral projection. I do not believe in fairy tales about chakras or energy or the power of belief. There is no such thing as spirit. We are made of matter and nothing more. It's just another tiny, momentary speck within an indifferent universe. You think too little of yourself. Oh, you think you see through me, do you? Well, you don't. But I see through you! To me. I pushed your astral form out of your physical form. Oh my God, I'm dead! You're not dead, you've just been separated from your physical form. My spirit came up out of my body in a very tremendous speed and I could look down and see my body laying on the bed. Where you leave your physical body, but remain conscious. Is this the afterlife? Thanks to cutting edge science, there are tools to measure those accounts. And there are some stunning consistencies. I popped out of my body. And my body was laying there asleep. And it was a very surreal thing. I'm gonna say that right now. Like I could not believe that I was looking down at myself. And I look down and I literally see myself sleeping in my bed. And all of a sudden I'm flying and I feel so like weightless and just giddy and like excited. So eventually I decided that I was gonna explore my neighborhood and then all of a sudden I look behind me and there's like this dark figure like this like evil looking thing. I lifted up and I looked down. Mom was in one room, you were in another room yelling at God. He caught up to me and put his hands on my shoulder. And right when that happened, I snapped back awake and I was in my body again. One website even writes regarding astral projection. Out of body and near death experiences are forms of soul travel. In 1972, the US government started a new program called ScanEat or scan by coordinate. Remote viewing research began in 1972 at the Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, California. Proponents of the research said that a minimum accuracy rate of 65% required by the clients was often exceeded in the later experiments. The government research project on remote viewing went by various code names until it was renamed the Stargate Project in 1991. On the CIA's own website, they have declassified top secret documents from the project, some describing a subject volunteered to attempt to locate a facility in the USSR comparable to the underground installation previously described. Then they reported that they found it, gave its exact coordinates, and described external features including helicopter pads, rail spur, and some large dish antennas. Another 1972 document from the Defense Intelligence Agency on Parapsychology Research quotes Edward Pullman, the director of the Southeast Hypnosis Research Center in Dallas, as telling the DIA, a spy would be hypnotized, then his invisible spirit would be ordered to leave his body, travel across barriers of space and time to a foreign government's security facility, and there read top secret documents and relay back their information. Such astral projection already has been accomplished in laboratory settings. Pullman said, adding that the Russians are probably now trying to perfect it. According to Pullman, the Soviets have realized the immense military advantage of the psychic ability known as astral projection out of the body travel. Another scientist, Sybil Leek, noted astrologer and author, states there is great danger that within the next 10 years, the Soviets will be able to steal our top secrets by using out-of-the-body spies. The documents containing this information can be found on the CIA's own website at CIA.gov. 
In 1995, Project Stargate was terminated. An independent review wrote, even though a statistically significant effect has been observed in the laboratory, it remains unclear whether the existence of a paranormal phenomenon, remote viewing, has been demonstrated. The laboratory studies do not provide evidence regarding the origins or nature of the phenomenon, assuming it exists, nor do they address an important methodological issue of interjudge reliability. So, they could not provide evidence regarding the origins or nature of the phenomenon. We, on the other hand, can know the source and origin of the phenomenon, for it has been revealed by God to be the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Whether out-of-the-body experiences, near-death experiences, remote viewing, astral projection, necromancy, which is talking to dead loved ones, or the doctrine of eternal torment in hell, all of these have for their foundation the doctrine that the soul is immortal. If the professed Christian were to take the Bible as it reads, that the soul that sinneth, it shall die, and the dead know not anything, he would recognize all these paranormal activities as the power of the enemy of souls, and would not be taken in Satan's snare. None need be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism. God has given the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. If there were no other evidence, it should be enough for the Christian that the spirits make no difference between righteousness and sin, between the noblest and purest of the apostles of Christ and the most corrupt of the servants of Satan. By representing the basest of men as in heaven and highly exalted there, Satan virtually declares to the world no matter how wicked you are, no matter whether you believe or disbelieve God and the Bible, live as you please, heaven is your home. Is it true that no matter what we believe or how we live, that heaven will be our home? The question was posed to Jesus by a rich young ruler. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? In Mark chapter 10, Jesus responded, quoting from the Ten Commandments of God's law, and said to the man, This do, and thou shalt live. The requirement for entrance into heaven is perfect obedience to the law of God, because God's character of perfect selfless love is the rule of the government of heaven. Anything short of perfect love, and it would not be heaven. The problem is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there is hope. Jesus Christ lived a perfectly obedient life in human flesh, for he said, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Paul therefore wrote, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Righteousness is obedience to the law. The law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law but he is incapable of rendering it. The only way in which he can attain to righteousness is through faith. By faith he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the obedience of his Son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure, and God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. This is how faith is accounted righteousness, and the pardoned soul goes on from grace to grace, from light to greater light. He can say with rejoicing, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I want to take a moment to speak directly to those who have had near-death experiences, spoken with their dead loved ones, or who are involved with astral projection. I recognize the experiences you have had and many of the things that you have seen, heard, or felt were very real. And in most cases, those experiences were very positive, hopeful, and encouraging. The true nature of these supernatural experiences is beyond the capabilities of science to explain, 
and beyond the understanding of mankind to discern its real purpose or intent. It is impossible to detect the true nature of these supernatural experiences except by the Word of God. When the Word of God contradicts your experience, though, what will you do? Will you believe what you see and hear and feel with your senses? Or will the Word of God be your source of authority? These experiences will bring you and many of us in the future to the test to see if we will place more confidence in what God has said than we do in what we are seeing, hearing, or feeling. Even before the serpent deceived Eve, God had already spoken that which was true. So when the serpent came with his lies, the deception could have readily been discerned. The same is true now. In near-death experiences, love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. The love of God, however, is something quite different. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Think about what this verse is saying. God's love was manifested in the magnitude of His sacrifice. Do we think that the Father yielded up His dearly beloved Son without a struggle? When His Son, who had already taken upon His heart the weight and burden of all the wrongdoing in the world, was then whipped, beaten, tortured, and hung on a cross, then it was seen that for the salvation of a fallen and sinful race, the ruler of the universe had made the greatest sacrifice which God could make. The love revealed on the cross for the salvation of man was a manifestation of the magnitude of God's self-sacrifice and self-denial. Shall the human race then walk freely into the Father's kingdom without acknowledging that so great a sacrifice was made for them in the person of His Son? Shall men and women enter heaven while they reject and deny the only means by which heaven has been made accessible? The only way into the kingdom of heaven is through faith in the sacrifice that pierced the heart of the omnipotent God. Only a divine sacrifice could atone for sin, and only those who acknowledge the sacrifice God made for man's redemption will see the kingdom of heaven. In speaking with his disciples about the way to heaven, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. To reject the greatest sacrifice God could make for the redemption of man is to reject God himself. This is why the word declares, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. To those of you who have had near-death experiences, seen or spoken with familiar spirits, or are involved in astral projection or other occult practices through which spirits commune with you, now hear the voice of God speaking to you through His Word concerning the sacrifice of His Son, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Having entertained evil spirits, whether you realize it or not, you will be under their spell and power. And most decidedly will this become apparent when you endeavor to cease these practices and turn to Jesus, as evil spirits will oppose your efforts. But you have a deliverer whose hands are stretched out still. At the name of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, demons tremble and flee. So hear the voice of God pleading with you now to repent of your sins, turn away from these deceptions, call upon Him today, and He will deliver you from Satan's snares. And know that when you acknowledge the greatest sacrifice God could make for you by calling upon the name of His Son in faith, that He will run to you and deliver you. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. My point in this video is not to denigrate those who have had these experiences or destroy their hope of heaven, but exactly the opposite to plant their hope of heaven in a sure place upon the merits of a crucified Savior and upon a plain, thus saith the Lord. If we do not understand the word of God, we will have no defense but to believe the serpent's words, ye shall not surely die, and we will readily receive his falsehoods in the place of Bible truth. From all we have considered in this video, we may safely conclude that science is a poor method to understand the supernatural and that near-death experiences, as discordant, contradictory, unreliable, and subjective as they are, 
are equally as likely to mislead the earnest seeker in their search for the truth after death. Only the Word of God and the Son of God who said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death, is the one who can give a truthful witness concerning what happens when we die. John wrote, this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. We have all sinned and broken God's law, the Ten Commandments, for sin is the transgression of the law. Have you repented of your sins? Have you repented of your selfishness? Have you asked God to have mercy upon you and to change your heart? If we do this, he promises, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses. What a glorious promise this is. And what is the land God promised to our fathers? Peter speaks of this promised land, saying, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. All who have received this transformed heart will ascend to heaven with all the resurrected saints from all ages and we will all together at the same time enter into the gates of heaven with Jesus our Savior. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And when will Jesus come for those who sleep in Jesus? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord.